to the newly formed Missisquoi Valley School District budget presentation for the 2019-2020 school year. I'm Julie Regenball, the Superintendent of Schools, and I will let the panel introduce themselves. I'm Laura McAllister, Business Manager for Franklin Northwest. I'm Chris Shepard. I'm the Board Chair for the new merged district. And I'm Megan Conley. I'm the new clerk for the new uh, district board. Okay. So let's get started with uh, some of our slides. We want to introduce, let people know who are on our uh, local board. Uh, currently on our local board, it's a six-member board. Uh, I am the chair. Don Collins is the vice chair. Megan Conley is our board clerk. And then Devin Batchelder, Eric Borgard, and Stephen Scott uh, are the remainder of the board. So I, we currently have a six-member board. Um, the articles of agreement passed, and so now we're looking to fill three more seats. Uh, can you let us know who will be running uh, in this election for those seats? Yes, for Franklin, which is a three-year term, it will be Vicki Groton and Peter Magnet running. For Highgate, which is a two-year term, there will be Jen Chevalier and Nola Gilbert running. And for Swanton, which is a one-year term, uh, Terry O'Shea is running. Great. So our agenda for this presentation is um, we want to talk a little bit about how we got here to be having a budget vote in June. Uh, we want to talk about who we are and what schools we represent in the new district, a little bit about those schools, um, just to let people uh, know what the staffing is in all of our schools as an overview, uh, a presentation of the pre-K through 12 proposed budget. It's the first time we've seen a budget of all of our schools together. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the any increases or adjustments that have been made to that budget, uh, estimated education tax rate information, uh, article language that you'll see uh, on the ballot, and where and how we can vote. So I really wanted to start a little bit um, about Act 46 and why we're presenting a budget to the taxpayers in June. Um, as people know, uh, nobody really wanted uh, Act 46 in our communities, but the State Board of Education made a decision uh, at the end of November to merge us into a single pre-K through 12 school district. And that original uh, timeline actually never involved us having a vote on March uh, town meeting day for a budget. Um, we were expected to organize within 60 days of that November decision and then we were going to elect a board on town meeting and then propose a budget and the hope was that would have been done in April. Well what actually happened is that the um, lawyers for the litigation that are fighting Act 46 and the state's attorney's office uh, agreed to postpone for a month because Judge Mello was hearing the case about Act 46 and was going to make a decision about an injunction. So both parties agreed to delay for a month. So we um, postponed our organizational meeting until February, the end of February. We held that meeting and elected a clerk and a temporary presiding officer to run the meeting. And then the voters determined uh, to postpone that uh, organizational meeting until uh, the case was heard. We did not have an injunction ruling at that point. It was right around the corner. So we postponed for another month uh, as community of voters. Um, so that also delayed how soon the new board could actually meet and do business. Um, we actually organized in late March, and the very next day, the new transition board met and began working on the, um, the budget and also um, creating articles of agreement or proposing them to the voters and electing uh, the newly elected board. Uh, and it was only the elected board that was allowed to propose a budget to the voters. So again, all of these delays just kick the can down the road of how soon we can put a budget in front of voters. So April 30th was the first time that we could vote on a new board, which everyone did. And uh, the very next day, that new elected board met. 
Uh, and within a week, they adopted a budget to put before the voters. So that's why it's so long in coming. Um, the other thing I think it's important for folks to know is that we were definitely working on the budgets, both in our local boards, making sure we were prioritizing what needed to go in our budgets to support our schools, uh, and the transition board was meeting through March until April 30th on putting together the merged budget. So that's what's taken us to June 11th for this vote. So Megan, I'm wondering if you can talk a little about who Missisquoi Valley School District represents. Sure. So the new Missisquoi Valley School District um, encompasses Franklin Central School, which is grades pre-K through six, also Highgate Elementary School, Swanton Elementary School, and Missisquoi Valley Union Middle and High School. Uh, we wanted to go through and sort of provide some highlights for each of the schools, um, just some tidbits that the, the schools are really proud of and want to make sure that the community is aware of. So we'll start with Franklin Central School. Um, their current enrollment as of October 1st was 142 students. Um, some of their points of pride, they participated in school-wide training and implementation of Number Talks, which is a math curriculum. Uh, to help students to be more accurate, efficient, and flexible with mental calculations. They also have really strong community involvement that makes possible programs such as the Four Winds Hands-On Science, Farm to School, Fire Safety Program, and 26 years of annual senior dinners, plus 56 years of the speech contest, along with many other um, really positive activities in the community. And finally, they are proud of the teamwork that exists with the students, parents, staff, the school board members, and the community as evidenced by the awards and recognitions that they have received based on outstanding academic student achievement and school environment. At Highgate Elementary School, uh, their current enrollment is 304 students. And they want to be aware, uh, be sure that the community is aware of their academic proficiency. Uh, August family conferences were put in place before the start of school to help facilitate communications between teachers and families, help teachers find out how students learn best. Math menu professional learning for teachers has also been a focus, and that is to increase the diversity of learning opportunities available to students in their math instruction. They also have high quality staffing. Teachers in Highgate have a well-established coaching model to regularly provide feedback and professional learning on teaching and learning. They have formal observations that are conducted using swivel video technology, and it allows teachers and administration to engage in rich discussions about teaching practices. It is also a positive climate for learning. This year at Highgate, the staff have engaged in professional learning about the use of restorative practices to improve students' social emotional learning. Staff have used the practice to facilitate positive professional communications as well. And Seesaw has been put in place as a homeschool communication app and has strengthened the ability to share information with families. At Swanton Elementary School, we are at a enrollment of 611 students. Um, at Swanton, we're in our fifth year of professional learning communities, uh, which we refer to as PLCs, in math and literacy. And we feel that our students are showing more success on local and state assessments due to the collaboration and alignment of our curriculum, instruction, and assessment. At Swanton, they continue to work hard to meet the needs of the social and emotional needs of our students by contracting with NCSS for behavioral support through our BCBAs and our school-based clinician. Um, BCBA, Julie, and that is a behavioral... It's a board-certified behavioral analyst. So they're okay. trained to oversee what students, the folks that are working directly with students and, and develop plans for them. Okay, wonderful. Uh, and finally, while other schools' enrollments across the state of Vermont have declined, Swatton Schools has remained steady and we are continuing to grow. And last but not least, of course, Missisquoi Valley Union Middle School and High School. As of October 1, the enrollment 
in 7th through 12th grade was 838 students. NVU offers a wide variety of courses for students, including in the arts, the foreign languages, business, family, consumer sciences, and our unique and popular agricultural program. An increasing number of students are taking advantage of rigorous academic opportunities such as early college, dual enrollment, AP courses, honors credential, work-based learning placements, and the personalized learning option, Humanities in Action. MVU students also contribute thousands of hours of service to our community through our middle and high school student councils, our honor societies, and other clubs and organizations. So I wanted to just sort of do an overview, since this is the first time people have seen the combined uh, a budget that covers four schools. I wanted to talk a little bit about what our staffing is. So general administration would be uh, curriculum directors, tech directors, special ed directors, and folks that work across all four schools to support teaching and learning in administration there. Um, there are 10 of those. Um, building administrators, which are uh, principals, assistant principals, and other administrative positions within the buildings. There are 11 across the four schools. Uh, we have over 227 professional educators in our buildings. We have 171 support staff, um, which is all kind of support staff, from receptionists to paraprofessionals. Um, and we have 21 positions that are contracted through agencies such as uh, Northwestern Counseling and Supports. So the budget that we're putting forward is a pre-K through 12. The total budget is $37,001,935. We're anticipating uh, $9,069,348 in revenue, which will give us a per, per pupil spending cost of 15,158. The pupil spending is an estimate only at this time uh, as the state has yet to set the yield. The breakdown of the budget between general education and special education is 74% or 27 million $425,490 for general education and then for 26% of the budget is our special education which equates to $9,576,445. Well and Laura our child count which is how many students what percentage of our population is eligible for special ed is pretty much in the middle of the pack statewide and it's in the uh, it's about 20 to 21 percent uh, and so we do get revenue to offset those costs can you explain a little bit about what kinds of revenue we get for that sure so there's special ed intensive revenues that we get so that would at about a rate of about 56 or 55 percent um, so we, that would be about 56 um, percent of 9.5 million um, sometimes we receive that in the year in which it's generated by special ed students and the, or sometimes it's in the following year when it's reconciled. Um, and then also there's um, intensive reimbursement. So any students um, that surpass a, per, a certain threshold, we would actually receive 100% almost of that um, expense reimbursed above and beyond that threshold. So um, that helps. You. It does. So the breakdown of the overall budget uh, Seventy-five percent is uh, salary and benefits, which equals twenty-seven million six hundred fifty-five thousand nine hundred thirty-eight dollars, and then the rest of the breakdowns break down between uh, purchase services, property services, and repair and maintenance, transportation of students, the tuition of students, uh, which go to outplacement, mm -hmm. uh, communication and travel. Supplies and equipment, dues, fees, and debts. Laura, could you explain just a little bit about what some of those categories mean? I mean, transportation, I think, is self-explanatory. It's the busing to and from school as well as students who need transportation to other, other schools. Mm -hmm. But what would go into something like purchase services? 
for example. So in this in this case, purchase services would include any contracted services other than tuition that we may have with NCSS. So it's school-based clinicians, behavior supports, um, those types of things um, in all of the schools, as well as any other purchase services. What um, maybe in plant, we may hire um, a contracted service to come in and um, provide a service in the building for maintenance. Um, that would be included in that as well. Thank you. This slide uh, is gets more, instead of a percentage look, it's the actual amounts of each of the um, function areas mm -hmm. of the budget. Mm -hmm. Function areas is, is how the state sort of requires us to categorize. So when we report out to the state, which we do many times a year from the business office, um, this is how we would sort of categorize the different expenses. So instructional programs, what is that? That's the money that it takes to actually educate students. So that's where your teacher's um, instructional costs would be, um, su um, supplies and equipment, anything that it actually takes to educate a child um, in a classroom. Okay. Now, I know in, in a merged budget, some questions would be the principal's office, for example. Um, in a local budget, that's a single principal's mm -hmm. building's principal. So in a merged budget, the cost for all of the school's principals and their administrative assistants or whatever goes into that line uh, is now in one larger principal's office budget, for example. Okay. And that would include registrars and office staff and copier expenses and those types of things in that budget as well. Again, the total budget number of $37,001,935. Mm -hmm. And I would add that in this merge budget, um, some things may have gotten moved around from where people may have been used to seeing them because we mm -hmm. had to sort of streamline where expenses were going to, where, where they were going to fall. Um, so, so we did have to kind of shift and accommodate that um, coming in from four different budgets into one. So some of the changes that are in this budget um, generally uh, increases in salary for uh, professionals as well as support staff. Uh, uh, one of the bigger drivers, of course, is health insurance. We're all, that's driving up the cost of, of all kinds of businesses, including education. Can you talk to us a little bit about the history? Of, I mean, 11.8% is, how is that, how do we come up with that number? So we belong to a statewide health insurance group called VHI, Vermont Educators Health Initiative. Um, and um, what they try to do is regulate these increases over a period of time with a reserve fund. And so it's a little bit atypical to see an increase this high, um, but belonging to this group does ensure that we, one, are getting a, a group pooled rate, and two, that in, hopefully most of the time you wouldn't see these big peaks and valleys. Um, and we'd be providing the best benefits we can um, for, our, for our staff. And, and these increases are really why the state is looking at negotiating health care together at a state level, hopefully to curb those costs mm -hmm. in the future. But that rate is given to us, correct? We didn't no, choose it. No, we did it. not calculate that. Okay. That's something that VHI does. So facility bond debt payments are uh, also added to this budget. MVU, uh, this is their first year of the bond, and then next year, obviously, will be um, interest as well as repayment. Mm -hmm. um, and next year, Highgate passed a bond this cu current year, and next year their interest payment will be in this budget? Right, and then Franklin had an existing bond that they're at the end of the repayment plan on, so that it would be in there as well, and I think it's a little over 300000 total. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other uh, investments in our bill, speaking of the bonds, uh, it, investment in building and grounds, repair and maintenance, uh, those investments were made in really all of the schools. Um, Chris, can you speak a little bit about why that's important? I know we had a lot of conversations in Highgate about that. Yeah, so we're trying to change the way we uh, maintain our buildings. Before, we were much more reactive. We're trying to switch to a proactive style. Unfortunately, I know in Highgate, for example, our buildings are so, um, I don't want to say worn down, but windows are aged, doors are aged, the roof is aged. 
So we need to, and the parking lot's just awful. So we have to, we had to go for a bond in order to upgrade the entire building all in one shot. But going forward, uh, all four schools are trying to be a lot more proactive and have lines within their budget for property maintenance, for building maintenance, um, so that we can handle things uh, year by year instead of having to do these bonds. Mm. Uh, the importance of maintenance, a prime example in Highgate, we had an alarm go off. We had to put all of our students outside on a very cold, rainy day, and it was a building maintenance issue. If we were a little more proactive, maybe we could have prevented that. Uh, and that's the route we're trying to go. Mm. I would add also that there's increased demand and requirements and, and certifications and that sort of things that are impacting our building costs, things like ADA compliance mm -hmm. um, and um, lead testing and these yeah. different kinds of things that are that seem to be happening to us that are required that may or may not be good. Um, there is added cost to that, and so keeping up with that impacts the budget. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the lines that I think it's important to make sure we touch on is the athletic and co-curricular line. Uh, although that was not a large increase, um, the MVU board uh, historically has had football pulled out of their budget uh, and had a separate article about um, whether we should support $10,000 for football for students at MVU. Uh, and the MVU board discussed that for three plus months. Um, it's a new board. Um, there have been changes to the program. Uh, actually, the Vermont Principal Association uh, Athletics met with the athletic director and the coach of the football program and really talked about how best to structure the program. Uh, and the decision was made to have them move from a varsity program to a junior varsity program. Um, they're talking about recruiting uh, in Enosburg and Richford and other students that don't have football to work more closely with the rec departments to sort of have a more of a feeder program to support it. Um, we have a number of students who are very committed to it that continually want that. Uh, and the board discussed the fact that given that it's a new district, it's very important to put all of the needs, including athletic and co-curricular, uh, that um, students are participating in in the budget. So they did make the decision to do that. And um, they really just did not want to have to have a separate article uh, imposed upon the new board. So we wanted to just really be transparent with the community that that was the decision that the MVU board did make. And the transition board was aware of that when they um, put this budget before the voters. Now, we also wanted to talk a little bit about early childhood. Um, we have had uh, uh, an expansion grant, a federal grant for early childhood that sunsetted. So we did make some uh, cuts to our early childhood program to make up for that loss of revenue. Um, we went down a classroom and uh, some staff because of that. Um, we also have made a reduction because um, we don't have a lot of teachers that move between districts, but one of them that did traditionally was a teacher of English language learners. And um, because Sheldon is being moved to the Northern Mountain Valley Unified School District, uh, and many students that were served there uh, were served by this teacher as well, we made appropriate adjustments in the budget to reflect um, the loss of the school. I would just like to speak to the grant funded teachers line that we have oh, yes. here um, just to um, point out that yes it does increase the budget line so the 37 million does include the cost for those grant funded teachers which is primarily interventionist for students in each building um, but there is corresponding offsetting revenue on the revenue side which reduces our spending per equalized pupil so that's important to remember mm -hmm. um, there. I'd also like to add something to the buildings and grounds. Something else that we're really looking at is improving security within the buildings. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of MVU's new bond is to improve our front door security and yes. then the security between the buildings and whatnot. And all schools are looking at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so um, based on the proposed budget, we have our estimated homestead equalized property tax so again, we are taking into consideration the 
proposed expense budget of $37,001,935, less the local revenues of $9,069,348. The remaining education spending uh, is $27,932,587. Uh, finally, the Missisquoi Valley School District fiscal year 20 estimated equalized pupil count is 1,842.76, which leaves us with education spending per equalized pupil of $15,158. And that leaves us with an estimated equalized homestead tax rate of 1.4212. So again, this is just an estimate at this point, um, but this is where all the towns in the district will be starting uh, with their property tax, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. So Laura, a couple of questions. So equalized pupils, mm -hmm. can you explain what those are so, and why it's so important to the calculation of our tax rate? Sure. So equalized pupils are basically a two-year weighted average. There's a calculation that the state does based on different needs of different age groups and different types of students with different needs. Um, and that is part of the large component of um, the tax rate calculation that they do. They will look at the equalized pupils across the state um, and then in our, in our school district as well. Um, our equalized pupil number um, pooled into Missisquoi Valley School District is down overall about five equalized pupils. Um, independently within buildings, some may have gone up like in Swanton and some may have come down like in Highgate. Um, but overall, we're only down about five. So there's a minimal impact to the, to the tax rate there. Um, but basically what you're doing is taking your expense budget, minusing the local revenues, and those local revenues are not taxes. Those are outside funding sources that we are anticipating. Things um, like federal grants, um, um, local grants, uh, carryover funds, those types of things that make up that money. When you remove those from your expense budget, you get your ed spending. That's really what the state is looking at that needs to be pooled together statewide to create this ed fund that needs to be funded with tax dollars. We would divide that ed spending by the equalized pupil amount, and that's where you get that ed spending per equalized pupil of 15,158. Now, the yield. Um, we used to talk, as another sort of vocabulary word with school <laughs> budgets, it used to be uh, there was a rate of spending, but now we have a yield, mm -hmm. which I always think of as like a seesaw or a lever um, that impacts our tax rate. Yes. rate. And the legislature sets that amount. In this calculation, we were using an estimate of $10,666. That amount is actually still yet to be set by legislature, but it's basically based on how much money has to be raised, other funding sources, but that's statewide, and um, which is really when I like to remind people that sometimes spending in a local school can go up or down, and a tax rate can still go the other way. And that's because we're really focused, or this calculation is all about a statewide ed fund and how much money needs to be raised statewide. Thank you. So doing a bit of a comparison to others for spending per equalized pupil, again, the MVSD proposed spending is 15158 The state average um, in 2017, fiscal year 17, it was 14651 Fiscal year 18, that increased to 15,368. 19, it was at 15,521. And the fiscal year 20 estimated amount is $16,111, which puts the fiscal year 2020 Missisquoi Valley School District proposed spending at $953 less than the estimated fiscal year state average. Yep. Typo there, I apologize. It's fiscal year 20. 20. I yeah. Fiscal year 20. <laughs> yes. Um, so again, when we are starting with that, um, the property tax of $1.4212 and then moving into the estimated homestead equalized property tax with the CLA adjustment, this is where the changes will come in and it will vary per town. Mm -hmm. um, so the CLA is the common level of appraisal. Um, Franklin right now is at 101.12%. Uh, 
Highgate is at 106.27% and Swanton is at 102.81%. And Laura, could you tell a bit more about the impact of the CLA and, and what that means? Sure. So that's not a calculation that we do. It's a statewide calculation, but basically it's, it's a comparison between statewide property values and town property values and assessments. Um, and so when your common level of appraisal is over 100 percent, it, it has a positive impact on your tax rate. And if you're under, then it would be a negative impact. That being said, our CLAs have come closer to the 100 percent or come down a little bit, even though they're over the 100 percent. So it is causing a bit of an increase from the prior year for all of our towns. That's for Franklin, Highgate and Swanton. They all went down about two points. Almost, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the CLA is where you know, we have one equalized tax rate that is generated by this budget, um, but the common level of appraisal gets applied to that, and that's why in Swanton, Highgate, and Franklin, we all see a different tax rate exactly. on our bill. Okay. And with this information, again, the estimated adjusted tax rate for Franklin is 1.405 in Highgate, it is 1.337, and for Swanton, we are estimating 1.382. The estimated tax rate impact uh, homestead value of 200,000. For Franklin, uh, in uh, fiscal year 19, your tax rate was $2,624. The estimated increase for fiscal year 20 is to go to 2810 for an increase of $186. For Highgate, FY19 was 2504 Estimated for FY20 is uh, $2,674 for an increase of uh, $170. For Swan, uh, FY19 was $2,554, estimated to go to uh, $2,764 for an increase of $210. All these estimates do not reflect any of the income sensitivity adjustments. Laura, so how, when we get our tax bill at the end, at the, how does income sensitivity play into that? I mean, most community members um, get some adjustment in their taxes if they uh, submit the homestead tax rate information, correct? Right, if they submit a homestead declaration when they file their tax return, yes, they, they would. And about between 75 and 85 percent of our community members in Franklin County receive some sort of income sensitivity. In fiscal year, I'm sorry, I go fiscal years, taxes work on calendar years. In 2018, um, that threshold was anyone below um, $147,500 of a, um, adjusted gross income would receive some kind of income sensitive, sensitivity. That's based on, again, your adjusted gross income, but also property values of your home. Um, but that could be up to $8,000, um, which is the limit on, on, on that adjustment. So. Um, a good portion of our of our taxpayers do receive some sensitivity. Um, that being said, the income sensitivity does leave a bit of a hole in the Ed Fund. So therefore, statewide, that is a hole that needs to be filled in the Ed Fund um, statewide. So the proposed budget article language for Article 3, which this is the, uh, the article that is our budget, it is not by any means uh, approval of Act 46. It is just the merge budget that, as of right now, the state has told us we have to put forward. And it reads, shall the voters of Missisquoi Valley School District approve the school directors to expend $37,001,935, which is the amount the school directors have determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year. It is estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of $15,158 per equalized pupil. We'll also be electing board members, the ones that we mentioned at the top of the meeting, correct? Yes, well, that'll be, I believe, Article 1. Okay. And uh, just to repeat, the board members that are running, uh, there's Vicki Grant and Peter Magnet running for Franklin for a three-year term. Uh, Jen Chevalier and Nola Gilbert are running for Highgate for a two-year term. And Terry O'Sherry is running unopposed in Swanton for a one-year term. 
We have scheduled a budget info meeting for June 4th, 2019 at 7 p.m. at the MVU Library. And I would just like to add that we really encourage folks to come out to the informational meeting. Um, this is a big change for all of us, mm -hmm. and this is the place to be to get those questions answered. Um, so please, if, if possible, please take the time to come out um, and learn more. I would also like to add that our office is always open at 100 Robin Hood Drive, which is central office. If people have questions, they can reach out to any of us, and I believe they could also reach out to any of you. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes definitely. We're also going to make sure that a copy of the budget uh, would be will be available on our website. Um, we're also beginning a new school district website, so it should be posted on both the Franklin Northwest website as well as the new Missisquoi Valley Schools website. Very good. So for the polling places and times, a reminder that it is taking place on June 11th, 2019. In Franklin, please head to the Town Hall on Main Street from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Highgate voting will take place in the Sports Arena at 243 Gore Road in Highgate Center. Again, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And in Swanton, you will head to the Village Municipal Complex on 1st and Elm Streets, uh, finally again from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Now it's a change for many of our communities to be voting by Australian ballot. Um, where can folks get an absentee ballot if they need it? They can go to their town clerk's office and they can uh, pick up an absentee ballot, which this is, like you said, a big change for Highgate mm -hmm. and Franklin. Uh, Swanton has been doing absentee, but for Highgate and Franklin, you, if you can't be uh, available to vote on the day, you can get an absentee ballot. And I think those ballots are with the town clerks now. They yes. They are. So um, I just want to close this. Um, and I, I thank you for mentioning before that this is not a vote on Act 46. Um, nobody in our communities was supportive of having a merger. Uh, it was something that was imposed upon our communities. Um, but we are we we now that it's in front of us we want to make sure that we are supporting our teachers and our children and our schools uh, to the best that we can so that the new district has the best footing it can to get started so we really do want to encourage people to come out and to vote on june 11th please come to the informational meeting on the fourth uh, go to the website uh, ask the business office for information um, we know it is a very big change for all of us, but we also know that people are very supportive of the learning that happens in our schools and hope that you'll come out and vote on June 11th.